the first really excited to have you guys with here tonight. It's, it's uh, one of the first times we've done an online trail school like this. And it's also the first time that we are uh, doing a maintenance focused curriculum. So Brian Testison uh, has been working really hard over the past couple months to put together some awesome curriculum uh, that's all focused on maintenance. So you guys are kind of the guinea pigs, um, but we're really excited to be, um, you know, doing, doing maintenance focused uh, trail school. I think as, as Brian will get into, maintenance isn't always quite as exciting or sexy as trail building, uh, but it's often the answer and, and super important. So um, yeah, just a quick note of housekeeping before, um, actually, I guess I'll, I'll go through our little menti and then hand it, hand it over to Brian, but a uh, quick note on, on housekeeping for tonight. Uh, Brian Testison, one of our awesome crew chiefs, uh, is going to be leading tonight. Uh, if you do have questions throughout the meeting, please go ahead and put those in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat. Uh, and then, you know, we can, uh, I'll, I'll kind of moderate that and uh, ask, ask questions uh, when there's a good time. So um, I'll flip through our little menti here. Uh, you guys can still see, see the screen, right? We, we see our geographic spread, a lot of Puget Sound. And let's see how much trail work experience. Looks like we've got some kind of mid-level trail work experience. We've got one expert uh, and a lot of newbies too. So that's great. And then we'll scan through questions real quick here. We're learning more about trail maintenance and building, sweet. Looks like just a couple questions, quiet group so far. Um, awesome, well, thanks guys. Um, again, I'll hand it off to uh, Brian Tesson and uh, let him introduce himself, himself and we'll go from there. Awesome, thanks for the introduction, Bobby. Uh, let's see, get my, my PowerPoint loaded for everybody here. And... All right. Uh, Thanks for everybody who logged on tonight. Um, yeah, this is the, the first online trail school that we're doing and we're focusing it on uh, maintenance and stewardship. Uh, please forgive this, the Star Trek pun. I really couldn't resist. Uh, tonight, I wanna go over a few core concepts. Um, this is basically gonna be hopefully like the one-on-one level of our a more expansive online trail school um, as as we move through into the future. Um, and these will just kind of be the prerequisite courses that you know everybody should go through, everybody should understand. Um, like Bobby said, this isn't necessarily the the coolest or the sexiest part of the um, trail building world, but it's definitely kind of the most necessary. Um, we have a lot of trails out there and uh, the trail crew can't maintain it all uh, without the help of of the army of volunteers that we have. Uh, so uh, tonight we're going to cover these basic elements: uh, tool and work safety, trail construction and uh, drainage, brushing and clearing, uh, leaf blowing, and basic stewardship. And so moving right ahead, uh, every work party we do, uh, if you've been to an ever work party, you've already heard the spiel. Uh, we start with brief safety talk. Uh, these are good key points to remember anytime uh, you're, you're working on a public trail or with a group of people. Uh, so starting with blood circle. Uh, the blood circle is, uh, as you can see, demonstrated by our friend here, uh, the radius that your arm and tool can create. Uh, and that's normally somewhere between six to 10 feet uh, that you wanna leave so that you're not striking other people. Um, you kind of always wanna be aware of who's in this zone and who may, who or what may enter that zone uh, while you're working. It's pretty easy for us to get really task focused and lose sight of, of what's around us. And so um, kind of just like having that the blood circle and that mnemonic device with the blood circle in your head is serves as a good reminder to just um, be aware of, of your surroundings. Uh, equally important, uh, probably more important for a lot of a lot of times to be aware of other people's blood circles as you move around. Uh, it's really easy to be like um, 
leapfrogging up to the next 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 task and walk right through somebody's work area and that introduces a a pretty big potential hazard uh if you're both not paying attention so you know that that awareness is is probably one of the more important things to remember when you're working particularly in a work party um and also uh excuse me um when i say who or what it's pretty common to see um dogs and children at work parties and both of whom may not necessarily be self-aware and so you know we need to make sure that we look out for those guys as well i don't know how to fix that either clear they're all drawing sorry about the red stripe folks uh my there we go. <laughs> my yeah, my partner has graciously helped me eliminate that. All right, uh, moving forward, uh, the other the other rule we talk about uh, following blood circle is all hands are all tools, and that is more or less an extension of the blood circle rule. Uh, basically, boils down to don't reach into the blood circle. Uh, if you're going to reach down and help somebody grab that that rock or that root or push that log and somebody's chopping on or prying at that object and make sure that you communicate with them and, and let them know what you're doing. Uh, you know, ideally you make eye contact and use words. Um, but you know, we're trail builders. We might just, you know, make eye contact and grunt and point. And as long as the person that is holding the tool understands and, and acknowledges you and stops moving your tool, uh, however you communicate is just fine. Um, again, the point is just to make sure that you're not reaching in and uh, getting chopped. And hand injuries are no fun. Uh, we've all been there and I don't want that for any of you. Uh, next on the list in our head safety talk, uh, tool transportation. Uh, this one's pretty basic. Uh, we just want everybody to carry their tools uh, loosely down at your side. Uh, so that if, as you walk, uh, if you stumble, you can kind of just drop it or toss it to the side uh, and catch yourself so you're not falling on your tool. Um, carrying your tools over your shoulder, uh, while it it's, makes you look cool, and sometimes is a little bit easier if your arm's pumping up because you've been carrying a tool for you know a mile down trail, it does create uh, a blind blood circle. Um, it is that it puts the... Uh, the business end of the tool behind you where you can't see it and it makes it pretty easy to, to strike somebody inadvertently. What is going on with this, Eliza? Excuse me. Clear uh, drawing. I don't know why it wants to draw it, and I'm trying not to fidget, although it's a habit. Uh, so, and then uh, tool handling kind of covers everything else that we do with tool. Um, so when you lay your tools down, uh, be mindful of what you're doing with the business end. Uh, my personal pet peeve is people leaving uh, rakes, tines up, uh, tines up in the middle of the trail is even worse. Um, I have stepped on on rakes and, and whacked myself. And not only is it painful, it's embarrassing because it's just so cartoonish and, and cliche. Um, so try to avoid creating those tripping hazards and safety issues by just um, putting the business end of the tool off the trail um, and preferably pointed down when possible. Uh, the example that we have at the bottom of the page is, you know, a pretty common trail tool that really doesn't offer you a, a obvious business end down option because it's multi-sided. So if you just put that whole head off in the bushes where nobody can uh, step on it or fall on it, that's kind of your, the best thing you can do. And a final note on that one, um, a lot of the tools have wooden handles and they'll just disappear if you toss them into the bushes. So try to keep them like at least close enough to the trail that, that we can see them uh, when, we're, when we're walking away from the work site. Some other safety considerations. Uh, if, you have, if you have 
be allergies or allergies in particular, uh, potential health issues like seizures, uh, please you know, let a crew leader know. Uh, if you're taking part in a 100% a volunteer run um, work party, it definitely make sure that everybody knows if you, if you might have a problem, um, if you get stung by a bee, particularly this time of year, it, it's pretty easy to, to stick a tool in, in a hive or a nest and uh, get into trouble pretty quickly. So uh, then warm up. Uh, Again, like usually we're hiking or riding into trail products, so it's pretty easy to end up warmed up. But like, um, like maybe like Swan Creek is kind of my local trail network, and it's such a small park that you don't really move long enough to get warmed up. Uh, so kind of just be aware of like loosening up your arms and your legs and your back before you before you go to work. Um, it's proven to reduce injuries, and and it'll make your workday a little bit easier. Uh, on that same note, lifting carefully. Uh, I just spent uh, two or three weeks on on light duty because of back injury, uh, and which helped me get this done, uh, this project done. But uh, it was no fun. So always just remember to know your limits. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of cool tools. Um, we have pullers and rock bars and rock nets uh, to help us move heavy things so that we're not overdoing it, hurting ourselves. And uh, Finally, like when you're doing trail work, don't don't overlook safety toed boots, um, gloves, eye protection, ear protection. Um, work boots are kind of heavy. Gloves can get sweaty in the summer, but you know they really they go. It goes a long way. Um, I even keep hearing protection in my bag pretty much at any time in case um, you know somebody fires up a saw or a brush cutter. Um, so that's pretty much it for. For the safety talk, um, pretty dry. But uh, are there any questions so far? Nothing, right on. Uh, so moving forward, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of trail construction, um, just so we can have this fresh in our head before we talk about how to maintain them. So broadly speaking, uh, your trails will either be a bench cut or a flat trail. Uh, bench cut trail is uh, think just what it sounds like, but sometimes people are confused by the term. Uh, so any any trail that's cut into a back into a side hill, like the example below, it's basically just a, what we refer to as a bench cut trail. Uh, and the alternative to that is um, any trail that's constructed somewhere where you don't have enough slope to cut a bench, and we just call those flat trails. Um, some good examples of this are you know, like a lot of trails at Doofy Hill, uh, Black Diamond Open Space is mostly flat trails. Swan Creek um, is mostly flat trails. And so when we're working with flat trails, a lot of times the drains are just uh, like ditches dug off to the side. Uh, but before we get into drainage too much, uh, let's talk about the soil types that we're dealing with. Uh, for, the, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to break it down into uh, what is duff and what is not duff. Um, so in Western Washington in particular, you're usually going to find a thick layer of duff on the forest floor. Um, and this is basically just the natural compost that, that accumulates, um, uh, from, uh, all of the, all the dead needles, branches, pretty much everything that falls on the forest floor. Um, it is, uh, holds water really well. It provides a lot of nutrients. It's usually full of seeds, um, and you know, due to those properties, it's not a great material to build a trail out of. And it's best to avoid you know, mixing it in when we're doing trail work, and uh, best to not allow it to accumulate on existing trails. Uh, so, what is mineral soil? Uh, mineral soil is basically anything that's not duff is going to be mineral soil. It's like everything below it. Uh, and mineral is composed of sand, silt, and clay. Uh, just for trivia, if you've ever, if you've heard the term loam, you've probably heard somebody referring to loam thinking it was duff um, when when loam is actually a uh, a particular ratio of sand, silt, and clay that actually makes for a uh, really good trail. Um, 
in any case, uh, mineral soil is what we want to build trails with. Uh, it compacts really well. It forms a hard trail surface that allows uh, water to run off of it rather than soaking into it. Um, incidentally, it's also fun to shape into things like berms and jumps. Uh, but you know, even a trail surface that's built out of ideal mineral soil and it's compacted well will still get muddy if you let water sit on top of it, which is why drainage is so important. Uh, preventing that standing water helps prevent um, mud, ruts, trail erosion, and uh, trail creep, which is uh, what happens when people ride around puddles and the trail just progressively gets wider and wider. <clears throat> so uh, I'm pretty spoiled. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and I've always had a year-round riding season and I've always kind of taken it for granted. Um, but we do put a lot of a lot of effort and thought into construction and the maintenance of drainage. Um, to maintain proper drainage, uh, we need to provide a place for water to flow off the trail and give it enough uh, enough backslope or excuse me, enough outslope to ensure that the water runs off the trail rather than just continuing down it. Um, example here on a bench cut trail. Um, the image on the top is just a basic, just a basic bench cut trail with no no drains built. And in this in this situation, you know, any water running down that side hill is going to catch that trail and probably just follow the trail downhill. Um, that's going to result in uh, trail erosion. And a lot of us have, have ridden that trail where the water's running down it and you're just like pedaling up or down like a, a muddy rut. Um, so to, to combat that, when we build the trail, uh, we create grade reversals. So we're forcing the water into a low. And then at the bottom of that low, we can outslope the trail enough that the water just goes down to a common point and flows straight out. Uh, we're using you know, hydraulic pressure to, to keep the trail clear and usually to keep the drain clear. On flat trails, it's a little different. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, flat trails usually use uh, some form of ditch. Uh, which, uh, when built well, does the job just fine. Uh, these are usually 12 to 18 inches wide, and they're built to be daylight drains. So a, a daylight drain is deep enough and gets far enough away from the trail that the water can um, dissipate, either evaporate or, or soak in, um, rather than backing up onto the trail. Um, Usually when you build these, you want them to be about two times as, as wide as they are deep. So if you end up with a 12 inch deep ditch that's three feet deep or three feet away from the trail, you want it about, about two feet wide um, just to manage any volume of water that, that might come in there. Um, and and as, you're, as you're doing maintenance, be aware that the ditches um, should have like tapered sides because the steep edges can check, uh, catch your tire. Um, I've, I've probably built a few of those and I've definitely stuck my wheel in them by accident. So uh, it's something that's definitely worth fixing if you're there. Uh, so what happens with drainage? Drainage fails, uh, drainage problems, we have puddles. Uh, we've all dealt with them. Uh, we've all had the wet feet. And how do we deal with it? Um, so, you know, your probable cause is that your outslope has failed. Um, and what we want to do is reestablish that outslope. As you can see here, uh, we've illustrated the, the slime dam that builds up over time. And um, you know, the original the original trail tread and how actually this is kind of illustrating where the dam has formed and the trail has actually started to erode because it's been saturated. Uh, and so, like I said, the, the most common cause of these puddles is the accumulation of leaves, needles, uh, and sediment, sometimes vegetation, uh, forming dams and turning them into puddles. Uh, so the example on the left is a, a flat trail, like it's, uh, actually a very flat trail and you can see where there was a ditch here and now it's completely filled in with vegetation 
and and on the right um, this is actually uh, a combination of of the the slime that is more or less duff that has formed from needles and and leaves that have broken down on the trail and also a bunch of sediment that's actually come down from this corner so people are coming through this corner they're skidding or it's just kind of naturally wearing and that that sediment's actually washing down and it's all just sitting here and the water doesn't have any place to go um, so obviously these are pretty easy to identify especially if you're, you're working or writing in the wet and um, the obvious solution is to try and just knock these dams out. Um, so if you're if you're just out for a ride and you just want to be helpful and you find a big puddle, uh, you can stop and use an improvised tool to just knock a dam out and or knock knock the dam out and just let some water out. Um, there's actually a a video that a gentleman named Davy Simon posted on uh, on the Tiger Mountain Raging Facebook page, where he uh, shows how you, people can just use their front tire to clear a, a like a, a failing drain, and that's a pretty good technique to just use your front wheel. Um, otherwise, I I'll often just dismount and, and use the, the heel of my boot or find a sturdy branch. Uh, the goal here is just to get get the standing water off the trail, so it's not uh, soaking in. Um, so th this is a, a great example of just how to prevent trail creep by at least eliminating the puddle. Um, most people will just ride ride straight through it and stay on line. Uh, so here's a great example of a pretty classic Northwest drain that is um, completely plugged up with uh, you know slime. Uh, so this is all needles and and mud. So if you're just riding along and uh, again, if you just want to use the boot technique, uh, just give it a kick and knock that middle out and you're going to let the water out. Uh, and if you're on a ride or you're in a hurry, that's probably good enough. Um, but if we're if we're doing a work party and you have hand tools, uh, what we want to do is is completely clear the drain out so that we won't have to think about it again for like hopefully a year. Um, and in order to do that, you're going to start same way by knocking the middle out and, and letting that water out. Uh, that way you don't have to work in, in like muddy water splashing yourself. Uh, and then from here, the objective is to scrape all of, of this slime away so that the water has a, a free path to just flow straight off the trail. Um, again, that four inch notch with your boot is going to clog again right away, like probably within a week. Um, so any clogged drain should just be cleared all the way back. Um, so with your tool, in this example, you're going to start by scraping as much of the much of the goo as you can off to the sides, um, so it's not going down into the into the drain. And then, as you get toward the bottom. You can let the drain kind of taper in and just um, and the water particularly on a on a bench cut trail you've just created a nice easy path for the water to flow down the hill um, so this is this is what it should look like when it's done um, and in this example uh, if if we were working on this in person i might even encourage somebody to continue scraping on the on the right hand edge of, of the trail tread here and see about removing the rest of this this accumulated slime um, just so that it doesn't um, just doesn't so it doesn't slough back into the drain right away like the more of this stuff that we can get clear the better um, also uh, just a note on that slime like it's it is really spongy like last time I rode rode up Tiger Mountain, there were some spots just on the climbing trail where I could see the water squishing out from the trail um, from the tire on, of the guy riding in front of me. Um, so it, it holds a lot of water, and the more of that we can get rid of, the better. Um, with with flat trails, um, we already talked a little bit about 
the fact that they're relying on ditches. And so our daylight drains on flat trails are a little different. Um, since flat trails don't always have daylight drains, um, to ensure that the drains work, we really have to make sure that we've cleared out. Um, that's funny, I didn't want to do that, but it kind of worked this time. Um, so we want to make sure that we've cleared out the um, the ditches, and, and a lot of times that will require um, not only scraping it with like a, a, a hoe or a cloud, but also getting in there with a shovel and, and just shoveling all of, all the vegetation. Um, a lot of times there's loose rocks and, and soil, just kind of miscellaneous stuff in there. So, um, and it's a good place for teamwork. A lot of times at a work party, I will try to um, actually set teams up where somebody can scrape and the other person can shovel it out. Uh, and that way one person's not carrying two tools. Um, pink. And then some final final tips on drain clearing. Uh, just let your tools do the work. Uh, you really shouldn't have to strike the trail tread with with a tool. Uh, you can do most of it just by scraping. Uh, in contrast, you may need to chop or dig uh, to get the plants out of out of a trench on a flat trail. Uh, Uh, and so, yeah, a, a good analogy is to uh, just shave the organic slime off the trail. And if if there's not enough outslope when when you've got all the all the slime off, just continue to kind of shave the silt and the dirt away until you've restored that 15 degree angle. And and also like if you're if you're using your own tools, definitely keep your own tools sharp. Um, I've been trying to make it a, a point to keep tools sharp for volunteers. Um, it really makes a big difference and, and dull tools don't allow you to make that nice uh, nuanced shaving uh, process. And, uh, and, and finally, uh, boots and gators. Uh, gators in particular are, are something that one of my coworkers turned me on to, and it's it's a game changer when you're out clearing drains or, or really doing trail work at, at large. Um, it's a pretty pretty dirty job, and being able to cover cover your pants up to your knees um, helps keep your pants dry and keeps all the any debris that might end up in your boots out of your boots, so you don't end up having like rocks in your socks at the end of the day, having to pull your boots off in the middle of the woods. Um, I think that that more or less wraps up the points I want to make um, for drain clearing. Uh, there's definitely some things that uh, from here, you know, everything is is practical. So once you understand these concepts, it's just a matter of of practicing them in the field and and getting your um, getting your habits dialed. And so if there's not any questions, uh, we'll, we'll move on to leaf blowing. Uh, so leaf blowing and leaf raking, if, if you're not allowed to run um, a leaf blower, is a great way to you know, reduce the amount of clogged drains and, like before they clog. Uh, like a small group with, with leaf rakes can, um, especially on a dry day before the leaves are wet and muddy can really make it easy work of clearing all of the all of the debris that breaks down um, and clogs drains later in the season. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I guess my my other comment on that is leaf blowers are kind of intrusive, but they make they make quick work of it. Um, however, you know a, a group of five or six people with leaf rakes can clear a couple miles of trail in, in an afternoon and that'll save you a bunch of time uh, like in this in the winter or spring. 
And on to brushing, which uh, seems very relevant at the moment. Um, you know, it's getting into getting into summertime. Plants are are growing like crazy right now, and you know, some of the common ones that require seasonal effort um, are familiar to most people: blackberry, uh, salmonberry, stinging nettle, scotch broom. <clears throat> uh, you know, understanding what you're working with is helpful. So if you're not sure what you're brushing uh, it's worth it to learn um, in particular if you think you might be working with stinging nettle poison oak poison ivy uh, which can all cause uh, skin irritation um, when you're cutting things back uh, it's hard to do it wrong you're, you're cutting brush away from the trail um, but best practices will definitely produce better results um, it's generally best to trace the vines back to the base and cut them as close to the ground as possible uh, even if sometimes you have to cut the same the same vine four or five times so that you can get to the base without having your arm get shredded by thorns. Um, but you know, it's usually worth worth the effort if you only just cut that first that first vine that, that gets it out of your eye line, it's most likely going to grow back within a week or two and become somebody else's problem. Uh, uh, if you can, it's even better to dig out root balls. Um, so if if you have a blackberry or a soundberry or something like that, and you can get to the root ball and it's close by the trail, um, dig that sucker out. It's a little more work, but it'll take a lot longer for it to return. Um, and if you're if you're dealing with Scotch broom, uh, which uh, is kind of my my personal nemesis, um, it can be you really want to deal with it um, at the end of the summer when it's when it's drought stressed, um, the smaller ones that you can pull are usually worth pulling. But if it's too big to pull, just cut it flush to the ground. Um, late in season, uh, usually after it's gone to seed, and then um, just kind of let it completely dry out and die before you before you bury it. Um, if you have a land manager that will uh, haul it away for you, uh, that's even better. Um, I know if I make piles of it at Swan Creek, sometimes they'll haul it off for me. Um, other vegetation uh, like grass, ferns, soil, et cetera, are usually pretty easy to just um, to manage with weed whips or uh, handheld head shears, where you can just dig them out with a shovel or a hoe. Don't forget to eat the blackberries while you're out brushing. Um, it's always a, a fun natural snack. Um, here we have a good example of our of our uh, illustrious uh, trail director, Mike Westra. Uh, doing some brushing with uh, hand shears on Silent Swamp. It kind of just proves uh, what you can get done with, with hand tools in a relatively short amount of time. But uh, clean brush is best handled, in my opinion, uh, with power tools. Uh, the favorite of Evergreen staff is a steel uh, 131 combi uh, with the hedge clipper attachment. Uh, they offer really good reach um, have about six feet of extension and you can cut right close to the ground uh, and they don't have the spinning blades that throw debris everywhere uh, i think they're particularly if you're working on public trails that are still open i think it's a lot safer than having having that spinning blade that just chucks to chuck stuff everywhere um, and as a reminder again all power tool use on public trail systems should be done with permission uh, there are some land managers that have a zero tolerance policy on that. Uh, if you want to, if you have a hedge clipper and you want to join join trail crew to knock out something like this mess over here on the right, uh, definitely give give our Bobby a shout and we can coordinate with you. Uh, volunteers with power tools are always welcome. Um, at least a welcome addition to a crew. We just have to put you in the right place. Uh, and again, even without the power tools, uh, good hand tools will get it done pretty quickly. Um, and that's after after a pass with the hedge clipper. So some notes on, on brushing to kind of drive this point home. Uh, you want to clear the whole corridor, not just the trail tread. And also you want to be aware of the trail ceiling. 
uh, plants like you know vine maple and hazelnuts in particular um, will sag pretty low overhead and they create a cool archway but only as long as people aren't hitting their heads on the branches and uh, during growth season or after heavy rain a lot of times they'll hang pretty low and um, I've, I've personally whacked my head and I'm sure other people have so those are a good thing to just get in there and, and clear overhead as you're as you're clearing um, if you're clearing uh, small blowdowns and storm debris, it, the same rules apply. Like try, try to clear beyond the trail tread. Um, leaving that whole corridor open reduces the the potential hazards of like handlebar clipping, logs, and um, hidden hazards. So some bigger maintenance issues um, that or rather here are some, some bigger maintenance issues that are, are pretty common that require some prior planning and uh, approval. And so if there's something on this list that you have on your local trail network that you wanna address, uh, give give your local um, trail organization a shout. I would say, um, again, bump this to Bobby, or if you know the, the person running your trails, uh, if you're from LA, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure Bobby can help you. Uh, so here you have the big ruts. Um, these are, are both massive, uh, massive drainage issues, but these are probably also associated with uh, trail routing issues. <clears throat> and so um, this will probably, there's some really easy like uh, Band-Aid solutions for this to try and get water off the trail. But long-term solutions might require working with land managers to to reroute these trails. Uh, large, big wet sections like this or this, uh, same kind of the same thing. Like there may be an, an easy solution to just get the water off, but it's, it's another thing where it's worth looking at it with um, some experienced builders and seeing if we can find a more permanent solution, whether that's a, a reroute or potentially like adding a culvert, uh, whatever it may take. Um, so again, just reach out to us. We'd, we're happy to, to work with you and, and teach you what we can. Um, hey, Brian, quick, uh, st stop you there real quick, go back to um, trail corridor and, and brushing. Susan had yeah, yeah. a question about how you determine the trail corridor and specifically she asked, um, you know, if, if you stand in the trail and, and stick your tool out to the left and right, is that how you determine the trail corridor? Yeah. I, I think um, that's how do you make that decision? Yes, I think that's a great rule of thumb. Uh, if like if you can stick your arm out and touch it, it's too close to the trail, and I'll usually go at least that far, if not twice that far. So roughly five, six feet from the trail edge with when it comes to um, like blackberries or salmonberry, uh, it, anything that's that's thorny and grows really fast. I, I'm not ashamed to cut it as far back as I possibly can. Um, if it's if it's thick and woody and, and hard to get rid of, um, maybe you don't have to go quite that far, like like saplings or things like that. You might just limb off. Arms length probably okay. Uh, so it, there's a little bit of a little bit of nuance, a little bit of experience involved. But I think rule of thumb, you know, five feet from the trail edge is, is probably pretty good for a lot of places where we're going to be brushing as long as nobody can clip a handlebar or pedal at the very least right <laughs> it, yeah the handlebars minimum. or pedals and and um this time of year i noticed more and more blackberries and and salmonberries trying to smack me in the eyeball and that drives me absolutely nuts um and so if, particularly for people that don't ride with with glasses or goggles it um it's pretty irritating so I like to get that stuff clear as, as far away as from the trail as possible. So we don't have to cut it two or three times. Um, let's see. So another, another issue that, that is probably will require um, a more permanent fix is something like this, where you have a, a turn with, with like multiple drains in it that still isn't draining. And in this example, you know, you can, you can scrape the drain where the arrow is again, but 
you're you have a drain in the middle of a turn and you're turning through it uh, so every time the bike passes through you're just you're just pushing more and more material into that drain so it'll never really last and it's just a maintenance it's just a constant maintenance nightmare um, in this particular case this is a before picture and i forgot to take an after picture uh, we rerouted this trail uh, last november and um, adjusted the line so that you're not turning through the low anymore and uh, all the drainage problems have gone away so it uh, it's definitely the sort of thing that you want to plan out with with a crew lead and uh, we can definitely help you work on that uh, so that may have been a lot um, any any more questions on that I'm so far. All right, so from here, there's just additional stewardship practices that I wanna cover. Um, and the first on that list is uh, picking up after yourself. Um, you know, pack it in and pack it out is um, almost cliche at this point, but it's really, really solid practice that that we all need to that we all need to maintain and um when people haven't packed it in and or have only packed it in but not out um sometimes you have to to pack stuff out for them um there are places where you end up with a big mess and it's it's worth just organizing uh, a trail a trail day or a work party uh, to clean all that stuff up and um it's again it's not glamorous work but the response from the fellow users and the land management is is always very positive um in this case we we were actually clearing out a uh a, an encampment but there was a, a resoundingly positive response from from the local <laughs> users and and our local land management for doing so um so as i think as as trail users trying to maintain our, our positive uh, positive image, it, it's one of those things that is definitely worth um, being mindful of. <laughs> the other one, and this really got on my nerves last year, is know how to poop in the woods. Uh, it's not something that, that everybody does every day, but it's something that you should know just in case. Um, there's a a few right ways and a, a lot of wrong ways to do it. And there's the resources are widely available online. There are tutorials. Um, people will will sell you all the right stuff for it. Um, but but you know, leaving something like what's in the picture is is a problem for a lot of reasons. Um, it's it's really unsanitary. It's totally unsightly. It makes everybody look bad. And um, if if a particular user group left my forest this way, you know. I wouldn't be real happy about it. Uh, so we'll we'll leave we'll leave that to uh, a Google search for you. But um, it's a little bit less messy. Um, something else that's really helpful for your local trail network is just clearing up like hazards, loose rock, storm debris, um, like storm debris. But like, storm debris, like what's pictured, is uh, the sort of stuff that breaks down, it causes drainage issues. Um, it gets in people's wheels and spokes. Uh, that stuff's all pretty small, but bigger ones will jam in your derailleur. Um, and it's really, it's really nice when it's not there. Uh, so like getting a, a work party together and, and raking that stuff off, um, clearing it by hand is, is a great way to, um, to give back. And it's the sort of task that you can do unsupervised. Yeah, on most trail networks and nobody's gonna be mad about it. Um, and so like uh, to complement that point, um, folding saws are usually, um, well, this is an example of a pretty, pretty nice, pretty expensive folding saw, uh, but you can get them for like 20 bucks. You can stop them in your pack. And if you go for a ride, um, you go for a ride after a windstorm, you can cut out any of the, the small blowdowns and, and cut, larger limbs that have fallen into manageable pieces uh, so that you can move them safely uh, by yourself. Uh, and then like loose rocks, 
Uh, if you're riding down trail and there's and there's a a big loose rock just kind of like sitting in the middle of the trail, um, there's a good chance that it fell out of the trail. Uh, places like Tiger Mountain and Raging River, we we use rock to um, armor the trail to keep it to make it more sustainable. And sometimes those rocks get knocked loose. So if like if you have that hazardous rock, like please take it offline and put it in a safe place. Um, but try to restrain yourself and and refrain from like just like kicking it down the hill and watching it roll. Um, as much fun as that is, and I'm guilty of that. Um, the builders really appreciate having those rocks readily available when we come to work on the trail, uh, it, and it saves potential future volunteers um, the trouble of having to find new rocks and carry them down the trail. Uh, so this is uh, reporting blowdowns and hazard trees. Uh, anytime you you can't manage something uh, with a folding saw, it's probably chainsaw worthy. And you should definitely just report it to the, the, your land manager, your local trail organization. Um, if you're in Washington, you can report it to uh, Evergreen, your local chapter. Uh, and and we'll get we'll get sawyers on it. Evergreen has a crew of of both paid and volunteer sawyers who are um, that carry uh, U.S. Forest Service um, certification, and and we we know how to remove these trees safely and efficiently, um, and we're approved by land managers to do so. Uh, so the best thing you can do is take a picture of the blowdown, uh, use your bicycle and. As a reference, uh, the wheel size in particular is helpful. If you have a 29er and you set it next to a tree and the tree is bigger than your 29er wheel, we know it's a, a pretty big tree. It's probably you know three feet in diameter. And that, that way we know what saw to bring. Uh, and you can report those. Um, you can use trail forks, I believe. Bobby, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe trail forks will, will allow you to do that reporting. Uh, if you have a GPS waypoint, you can report it on uh, social media. Most of our favorite trail networks have um, Facebook groups associated with them, or you can send that again, information once again straight to like Evergreen or your local trail organization. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's very very helpful to have a GPS waypoint or a solid landmark um, and and a reference for the size of the tree, so we don't show up with a saw that's way too small. Or, or hike a, a 30 pound saw and when we only need like a, a folding saw. Um, yeah, and I, if I could just add to that, Ryan, on trail forks, um, you're, you're exactly right. Trail forks does have a feature to do that. Um, that's something I'd encourage everyone to do. It's actually really fun. If you, if you record your ride on trail forks, or even if you don't, you can go and submit a ride report, which is really nice for all of us just as riders, because you can see if it's muddy or if there's a tree down or whatnot. But for big issues, like if there is a tree down, um, like Brian was saying, you can take a picture of that, put it on trail forks. Um, and we're doing a better job at, at using trail forks to actually figure out what's, what's um, you know, where, when a trail has problems. Um, and I, I believe on trail forks, if you upload a photo, I think it might just use the, the geo tag in the photo to, mm. um, to show people where it is. The one other thing that I'll say on that is that um, if you're in King County here, and you ride at Duthie Hill or um, Black Diamond Open Space, we're actually not allowed. Nobody besides the county is allowed to use power tools there. So the county has a tool called C-Click Fix, uh, where you can report problems much in the same way. You can upload a photo with a geotag um, from your phone and, um, and somebody from the county will go um, cut down that tree or whatever it might be. Awesome. Thanks, Bobby. I, I forgot about the, the King County issue. I, obviously, I don't don't work in uh, Doofy very often. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Uh, next. Uh, yeah, this is another one that will make the trail trail builders either really cranky or or you'll really appreciate it above you. Um, just respect trail closers. Uh, I know that, uh, especially once again, if you're if you're in the the, the King County like I ninety corridor. Uh, you you may have been part of uh, 
Uh, you may have been been part of the, the the group of people enjoying some soft opens in the last couple of years. Uh, Canyon Creek, we soft opened, uh, and so it can get a little confusing. But generally speaking, if if you see a bunch of tape across the trail, um, or or a fresh closure sign, that that means that we've We've closed it, we're working, we may be running chainsaws and dropping trees. Um, and, and we really, really need people to stay off the trail for a little while. So that's one of those things where, uh, you know, if, if your friend's trying to pressure you onto a closed trail, uh, maybe just just poke them in the eye and, and tell them that you're gonna, you're gonna make the trail builders angry. Uh, that's, that's about all I have to say about it. Uh, and on that same note, um, you know, just don't don't be a jerk. Uh, even on bike only trails, uh, there are a lot of hikers who are, are just out of out of place because they're lost. Um, and it only takes you know one bad experience to to really kind of turn them off to a to the mountain biking community. Uh, and you never know who you're dealing with. Uh, there have been some recent uh anecdotes of uh elected representatives having some questionable interactions with mountain bikers and you some of you may have heard the story that came out of uh, uh bellingham where the mountain biker got stabbed uh, so there there are a lot of reasons where to just you know take a breath and, and be respectful. Uh, we are a really big community and we're growing. And um, the best thing we can do is, is try to be respectful and cordial to other people on the trail. Um, and, and I think that'll go a long way. And, and finally, uh, some other things that we can do to uh, take care of our trails and our community. Um, or just to Im improve your skills, um, whether that be for you know trail maintenance, uh, I would encourage everybody to uh, learn CPR and first aid. Maybe take a a, a bike skills course um, because the, you know the better you are on your bike, the, the more things you know how to ride confidently, um, the less likely you are to. Um, get in over your head and, and cause damage and the more fun you're going to have at large. So, um, I think that's, that's a win-win. Uh, I've been riding bikes for a long time and I learned something from, uh, something new every year. So we all have room to grow. And, and finally, you know, you can, you can sign up for Evergreen Trail School, uh, and, um, uh, and help us build and maintain more trail. Uh, you know, and lastly, um, you become a member and, and talk your friends into to supporting us. Um, so that's, that's all I have. Um, uh, are there, are there any questions to, um, to answer here? Awesome. Thanks so much, Brian. We'll stick around for a little bit. If anyone has any questions, I think at this point you can put them in the chat. Um, or since we're kind of done with the presentation, feel free to come off mute and, uh, and uh, ask your question if you have one. And actually, I can get us started here real quick. I noticed there was one that, that we missed, Brian. Um, let me find it about um, uh, clearing wet areas and drains. Brian was asking. Um, what do you do about areas that already have a lot of ride around? So I think, and, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm imagining, you know, we see a lot of times there are areas where, where there's a puddle and everyone starts going around it and around it and it gets worse and worse. Um, sometimes those are big issues, uh, but can you, you know, can you speak to, is there a quick fix? Um, yeah, so that was something that I, I debated on putting into this uh, program and, and what you're describing is, is generally just referred to as trail braiding and sometimes trail braiding is a, a really you know, excuse me a really big issue um and it's 
uh, it's not always clear which which line is the best line. So it, we kind of left that out. Um, but if you're really familiar with the original line, um, it's as simple as just replanting some ferns. Uh, assuming that you can make the original corridor work. So if you've gone through and you've tuned up the drain and you've, you've scraped it out and you've got it clean and it's, and it's working, uh, then it's usually just a matter of, of throwing a few, transplanting a few ferns uh, and leaving maybe a couple of logs just kind of um, off to the side of the original line to close down, to close down the right arounds of the braiding. And um, that's usually enough to just get people back onto the original line. You don't normally have to do a lot. Um, another question, Brian, and, and these are just coming into the chat and then I'll, we've got a few that we'll answer and then we can um, let people come off mute. But question about breaking bumps. Uh, and before I let you answer that, actually one thing I'll say, I, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. So this is Trail School 101. Uh, maintenance 101. This is the first time that we've done just a maintenance focused curriculum. Um, and our plan actually is to build this out and have a little bit more of a robust sort of series of, um, you know, maintenance courses. That's something we haven't done in the past and even building courses. So hopefully we'll have a, you know, a, a maintenance 110 and a 201 eventually. Um, but, you know, so, so breaking bumps, obviously maybe, maybe a little more advanced, but uh, Brian, can you speak briefly to uh, fixing breaking bumps or, or is that a topic for another day? Uh, fixing breaking bumps is, is tread work. And I would say, get a, get a hold of, of your, your local, uh, like trail lead or, um, uh, you know, get a hold of Bobby and it just, yeah, that, that's something that, that we should talk about. Um, they're not necessarily hard to fix, but it's easy to do it wrong. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great work party to just, to help, Maybe we can help you schedule it. Um, you know, if it's something you really want to fix, uh, I I like to encourage people, um, particularly at, at Swan Creek, at my local my local backyard trails. Um, you know, if they if they have something that they want to fix, like get a hold of me. Like I'll help you run a work party, and we can all we can all kind of learn to to work on that together. Because um, I really do like that community element of it. Uh, but yeah, I don't want to just tell people like. Go, go fix them right now. This, this is basic maintenance. That's great. Yeah. And, and um, you know, definitely reach out to me if, you, if you're interested in learning more and, and reach out to our chapters as hopefully all of you know, Evergreen's a statewide organization. We have eight chapters across the state. So, you know, most of the work we do is, is volunteer led in our chapters. So it's not always Brian or I, um, but, you know, talk, talk to your local trail stewards or your chapter. And if you don't know who that is, um, feel free to email me. I'll, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, one thing I, I do want to answer one question that I see we have here from uh, Matthew Clark. I think this is sort of a good sort of general thing to talk about, which is Matthew's question is, who do we talk to about building new trails on new chunks of land that aren't currently supported by Evergreen? So this is an awesome question. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big process. I think a lot of times I certainly didn't know before I started working at Evergreen how much time goes into, into just developing a new area. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, we, we just... Well, yeah, we're hopefully about to break ground on some projects that have been, you know, a decade in the making. So it's years and years that our trails director and our executive director will often put into those projects. Um, it's all one, one thing I just want to kind of say is that Evergreen, we're a nonprofit. We don't when we build trails. We don't manage any land. Um, so, you know, when we're building at Tiger Raging, we don't set the rules for those. We don't even set, you know, the, the trail grade most of the time. If it's black or blue, that's the Department of Natural Resources. So we have a process where we work through with our land managers to, um, you, you know, build a trail, get a contract going. Uh, it looks very different uh, all over the place. So if you have a chunk of land, uh, Matt, or, or anyone else that, you know, you think has potential for trails, um, talk to us, talk to the land manager. You know, we're, we're, we're not always able to, to really get in there and, and do something, um, but we can at least point you in the right direction a little bit. Um, and ultimately it is gonna be a process of working with that land manager, whether it's private or public um, to, to uh, you know, get something going there. And Brian, you, you have a different perspective. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, that was a, a perfect summary. Uh, yeah, there's, there's stuff that I started hanging ribbon on you know, three years ago that, that may never, um, get built in while I'm, while I'm with the organization. Uh, mm -hmm. 
it it's a patience game for sure. Um, I think I think Mike said that it took 15 years for a Wally to get built. So that that's not the rule, but it's fairly common. I'm back to Brian's point about being respectful. Actually, you know, in a funny way, sometimes that's the most important thing that we can all do uh, is is be respectful of others. I can't emphasize enough how many circumstances there are that we deal with at, at the headquarters on the admin team that are the results, you know, sometimes over years of one person uh, being disrespectful to, to somebody on the trail and they call local parks and mountain bikers get a bad rap and it's, it's one incident or, you know, the person that, they, that they're rude to or that they pass, you know, really closely is, uh, is an electric representative or something like that. It happens a lot. And so, um, you know, we've come a long way, but uh, mountain bikers still sometimes we need to, uh, you know, really prove to people that we're, we're uh, good, good trail users. So, and that's why you all are, all are here, right? So taking care of trails. And any more questions, feel free to come off mute. I actually had a question about how often you encourage people to kind of do that rogue maintenance, or I guess like, I don't know, I guess just as somebody who's kind of like freelance doing it on their own, how often you really encourage that versus like, oh man, is this person gonna do it totally wrong? Kind of what your lines are there. I don't even have if you don't mind i'll start on kind of the the um the less fun sort of the technical side and i'll let brian talk about more the the actual content trail side um you know it, it is sometimes a bit tricky with independent uh maintenance work but the first thing i'd say is just get in just get in touch with evergreen whether it's me at the hq level or your local chapter and just talk to them about maintenance and um you know it, it is across the state we have so many areas it can be kind of ad hoc how that works um, to, to get involved. Um, but what I would say is if you're going out on your own, you know, there are certain things that I wouldn't even really call it volunteering, but just, you know, stewardship, uh, things that you can do to, to keep, you know, uh, the trails running in good shape. So like using your bike tire, your shoe to kick out drains, like Brian talked about, that's one of the biggest things. Um, you know, if, if you've got a pair of a folding saw in your backpack and you just happen to carry that with you on your ride and cut it, um, that's great. And, and those are things you can do on every ride or every, you know, um, once in a while. Um, so kind of, however, you know, whatever works for you, the, the more, the better, right. Um, you know, if you can kick out, if everyone kicked out one drain, our trails would, would drain a whole lot better. Um, but, uh, as far as that bigger work, I'd say, you know, get involved with Evergreen and, and talk to your, you know, the Evergreen can help you talk with the land manager or whoever, uh, for, for bigger kind of volunteering initiatives before you go out and do some of that. Yeah. Brian, um, you, I would just add to that. Uh, yeah. Um, so I sorry I was distracted I don't know what's going on with the with the draw function like uh but uh I've like part of part of what what inspires me to to do this and really focus on the maintenance is that I really want to encourage like volunteer stewardship and and volunteer um like groups to take ownership and and handle those things so it's it no longer feels like a rogue uh maintenance deal but where like three people can can take ownership of it and say oh we're we're actually maintaining this trail network this is we're taking ownership of it this is ours um and the, the other thing I, I like to remind people that um uh, like that i'm working with like at, at swan who i've given gate keys to because they've agreed to uh, um you know adopt a trail is that your volunteer hours are really valuable and we like to we like to catch those and and have um have those be uh, recorded so that we can report them to you know the parks department or the county or or dnr uh, it helps it helps us in a lot of ways it helps us maintain uh, funding it helps us secure grants and it just it just goes to illustrate like what we're giving back to to different trail networks uh, so like Jenny, if you wanted to get involved, like, you know, we could get you up and rolling and, you know, like you figure out how you can report your hours. Like it's usually a little bit of vetting um, personally. Like I just, uh, depending on what network you're working on, uh, 
you know, if, if I've seen people do do good work and there's some practical practical leadership and, and practical experience, and you know, I I would love to have people doing that maintenance without necessarily needing feeling like they need supervision. Sorry, long explanation. No, that's really great. Thank you. I feel like that was perfect. You're welcome. Brian, Brian, you used a, a term that's been on my mind, which is adopt, which is this this notion of you see it on roads, you know, a, you know, a highway adopted by X organization or people for cleanup, right? Um, and this idea mm -hmm. that groups, you know, to say like this trail ccdh or, or whatever is adopted you know i have a sign up that says like you know is maintained by x person or group or whatever and sort of put ownership on this notion of trail adoption from a maintenance standpoint um i just arbitrarily picked a trail that needed a lot of love at tokel this winter because i was just like i got time i'm gonna do it i talked to peter i was like i'm gonna go out and start cutting brush back <laughs> why not um and even now in the spring it's like i'm gonna go check on it i'm gonna go see like how many of those vines have grown back and now that you've told me to cut it back five feet i'm gonna need a bigger tool um because clear cuts aren't kind um but i i no. how much of that how much of that mentality of encouraging people to adopt a trail or a section of trail, right? Like you got upward mobility, you got a, that's a long trail or, you know, or whatever, you know, section one adopted by whoever, like Bobby, is that, is that a strategy that, that we can, we can look at in terms of, you know, leveraging people and putting ownership on it. Um, and then, like you said, Brian, to, to then give people the agency to do it rather than, Oh, you, you got to, schedule a thing with a person who knows you know because that just let's look at the pandemic work parties were tough right um to make happen so anyways that's just been on my mind so yep matthew i, I think you're making a great point um and it personally like it sounds like you've you've been pretty closely involved with the organization you probably know uh cody olson who was our our Patrick country trails maintenance lead um, and I think he and I have talked a little bit about the notion of, of trail adoption. Uh, he helped uh, Chris Lynch and his crew get in touch with uh, like DNR and come to, come to a, an agreement on, you know, ways to improve uh, like off the grid. And uh, they actually, I, I just saw their work on uh, East Tiger Summit Trail the other day. And that's that's running really well now. It's going to complement um, all the extra traffic going down uh, to ET. Um, so I want to encourage it. Uh, and if it's a really long trail, like upward upper mobility or uh, master link, it could potentially be, you know, different people. Like I, and I think one of the roles that Evergreen can serve in that case is just to vet people and and get everybody together um, so that everyone's on the same page and communicating and then just kind of ensure that um, the work is getting getting done and there's a point of contact but I, I would I would love to have more people feeling um, empowered to to step up and say I would like to just do some maintenance on this is that possible? And then we can start that conversation. Yeah, and for those of you that are familiar, Chris Lynch is a um, Evergreen um, chapter board member and, and volunteer. And his he kind of took on, um, you know, sort of adopting informally uh, a trail on, on Tiger Mountain over the winter, which was awesome. Um, and so I think, yeah, the, the advice is, I guess is, you know, it's, it is sort of a tricky thing from a, you know, um, formal perspective, uh, you know, we've, we've looked at trail, all sorts of trail adoption programs and um, long story short, it's, it's uh, hard on public lands, but, you know, in the, in the sort of the informal sense of, you know, Chris Lynch getting involved um, and, and sort of his crew taking over maintenance of that trail. 
uh, that's that's awesome, you know. And, and Chris Lynch is a, a trusted volunteer that's worked with Evergreen for years, and so it was easier to sort of set that up. Um, but you know, if you're again, if you're interested, get in touch with your local chapter with me, and um, you know, can kind of get get experience and um, uh, you know, get get out there and and uh, pick a trail. You know, like Brian said, <laughs> maybe Brian Brian can help you kind of pick a trail to work on at Swan Creek or somewhere. Hey, y'all. Uh, I actually have a quick question. I know earlier you were talking about uh, leaf blowers on some pieces of land not being uh, acceptable by the land manager. Is that specifically internal combustion leaf blowers or would like an electric, you know, like they have those battery powered ones now. Uh, is that acceptable or is it just leaf blowers in general? Uh, the, the battery power loophole doesn't work uh, for the uh, this particularly King County that this um, we've uh, has been the most specific about these limitations. Uh, but yeah, like battery powered blowers, uh, line trimmers, and chainsaws are off the table as well. Uh, they they have they have their reasons, and uh, we just we just have to respect them. Uh, but uh, so we're we're stuck with leaf rakes. Um, at like Duthie and Black Diamond, but a lot of other places. Um, if if we've approved it, and we and you're a vetted volunteer or you're part of a work party, um, gas or battery power blower is is usually okay. Awesome, thanks. More questions? We have a couple more minutes here. Yeah, so I got a uh, quick question. Um, when it comes to things like trees that have like blown down during like windstorms or something of that nature, uh, when do you guys decide uh, if and when uh, a feature or something like that can become like a, a new feature on a, on a particular trail? Um, just kind of curious on that matter. Uh, I, I think that depends on the trail, um, and and also the the maybe even the community of riders that frequently use that trail. Uh, I I have one in particular at Swan Creek where anytime a tree falls, I actually want to incorporate it into. Some, some sort of feature and usually a, a volunteer soil will end up cutting it out before I get the opportunity. Um, <laughs> and so it, it's it's frustrating because it goes the opposite direction. They're taking too good a chair of the trails. Uh, but in my experience, it usually seems that uh, the stuff that, that blows down and, and creates potential features is usually doing it in the, in the wrong place. Um, I don't think I don't think DNR really wants um, a overnight addition of you know a three foot drop on CCDH. And so in a lot of cases where the builders and a lot of riders would really have fun with that, uh, we are limited by uh, you know the agreements that we have with with the people that own the land and um, you know establish a contract to, for the standards of the trail. Cool. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Tokel's probably another place you can get away with that. Any more questions for Brian? Cool. Well, I think, uh, I think that's it. I will um, actually, I'll just uh, give you my, my email address is uh, Bobby Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T at evergreenmtp.org. Feel free to email me. Uh, I'm sure you can email Brian too. I CC'd him on the email earlier today. Yours is Brian T, right, Brian? At Evergreen? Brian T. So if you have questions for us, yeah. feel free to reach out. Uh, I won't be of much help at all. It has to do with actual trails. That's uh, I'm, I'm uh, 
a desk jockey, but Brian can help you out with that. Um, but again, thanks so much for, um, for, for jo joining us tonight. Really glad to you know, have a pretty good turnout, uh, it seemed like, for, for our first ever online trail school and for um, you know, our first maintenance trail school. So again, over the coming months, we're hoping to, to do some more advanced maintenance series and eventually advanced digging series too. So um, thanks again. And, and Brian, any, any closing thoughts before we sign off? Uh, no. No, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Uh, personally, thank you for coming out. And um, I, I really appreciate all the attendance. And I, and I hope to, to be able to um, work with a lot of you guys uh, at work parties, uh, hopefully throughout the next year. It'd be, be cool to meet a lot of you folks in person. So yeah, with that, I'd say cheers. Go have a beer. Cheers. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great thank night. You, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, guys.